due to Jennings has been a previous guest. He played a DJ whose radio station was being shut down by the government as martial law was being declared. The reason we play that is that Stephen King went on HuffPost Live, I believe, yesterday, gave some very interesting comments, and we're going to roll that clip now. Go ahead. It's tiring to look at the, and to say the world looks more and more like George Orwell's vision in 1984, where war is a constant thing. Um, we went in uh, to the Mideast, in my view, in the wrong direction with George Bush's adventures in Iraq, uh, when the real problem and, and the basis for the bringing down the, the towers was in Afghanistan. But it's been since that happened, uh, that re region has become destabilized. I don't hold any brief for Saddam Hussein. I think that he was a terrible man, but there was a stability and checks and balances at that time that doesn't exist anymore. There's a kind of anarchy, and it's a little bit like a bump under the rug. Um, we, we dealt as well as we could with Al-Qaeda for years, and now we've got ISIL, and uh, you know, pretty soon it will be somebody else. And it's impossible for us to put boots on the ground everywhere that we go. We can't police the entire world. So it's, it's just a little bit depressing. There's Stephen King on HuffPost Life talking about permanent war for permanent peace. And of course, the characteristic of a banana republic is expansion abroad, empirical expansion abroad. While the police state grows at home, they see Stephen King fears the world is starting to look like Orwell's 1984. We also got another clip which ties into this regarding the police state. Cash is now criminal. Possession of cash is being treated as a criminal offence in and of itself uh, by some police departments. Here's a clip from John Oliver. Public trust in the police is one of the most vital elements in a civilised society. But for many Americans, that trust has been undermined by a procedure called civil forfeiture. Now, I know it sounds like a Gwyneth Paltrow euphemism for divorce, but, but incredibly, it's actually even worse than that. Civil asset forfeiture is really a mechanism by which the uh, state and federal government can seize people's property without having to convict them of a crime. Most people can't afford to hire a lawyer to challenge it. It's really legalized robbery by law enforcement. And think about it, that is a tough crime to report to the police. Uh, give me a description of what the guy looked like. Well, to be honest, he looked a lot like the guy currently asking me what the guy looked like. <laughs> and if you think this sounds bad, just wait until you see how it looks. Because the Washington Post recently published a major investigation featuring stories like that of this man, who was driving from Michigan to San Francisco with $2,400 in cash that his dad had lent him to start a new job when he was pulled over in Nevada. I gave him my license and registration, and then as he was looking at that information, he asked me how much money I was traveling with. Lee told him about the money his dad gave him, which he kept in the trunk. He, he told me to turn on my air vents on high and roll up my windows and get out of the car because he was going to run a canine around it. Dove didn't find drugs, but he did find the $2,400. He said, no, I'm going to keep the money because I've concluded through my investigation here that you are traveling from Michigan to California to <laughs> purchase drugs. Wow. I mean, there is so much wrong there, including the fact that any policeman who genuinely believes you need to travel from Michigan to California <laughs> to purchase drugs needs to be introduced to the concept of the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Okay. okay. That's the clip there. And it's basically, you know, your property is guilty until proven innocent, David Knight. This is about the criminalization of merely possessing cash. Well, I'm glad to see that the mainstream media is starting to talk about this. I remember back in the 90s when I was involved with the Libertarian Party, we were screaming at the top of our lungs about civil asset forfeiture and the way that it was destroying the fabric of uh, our society, law enforcement, the courts, everything. They can go in and charge an inanimate object with a crime, and they've done it over and over again. And this was really old news back in the 90s, early 90s, before the internet. They would go in and they would, you would see court cases where it was US government versus Learjet, serial numbers, blah, 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 they confiscate. Why did they confiscate that Learjet? Because a guy who offered essentially a, uh, a contract taxi service, if you will, had flown a couple of in, 
individuals out of the country into Canada and then back. They subsequently found that those individuals were involved in a drug deal. They arrested them, they charged them. They never charged the guy who owned the plane. They never asserted that he had any culpability in any of this, any knowledge of what was going on, yet they still would confiscate his plane. I could tell you stories for a half hour about what was going on with this. I'm glad they're finally paying attention to it. But look at this situation with LIBOR, for example. We've got a London banker, a senior banker for a London bank, pleading guilty to fixing the LIBOR rate. He is facing up to 10 years in jail. Now, he hasn't been sentenced yet. In other words, that's the maximum he's going to get. People who are found guilty of possessing a small amount of marijuana, thanks to the Reagan administration's mandatory minimums, can get more than 10 years just for that. But this is a guy, and these are banks, where they, they say, according to this uh, RT article, they fraudulently boosted their profits. They say a senior banker has pled guilty to a conspiracy to defraud and manipulate the LIBOR. And they're saying that he colluded his bank and other banks colluded together. This is a conspiracy. This is a real conspiracy, folks. <laughs> it really happens. They're charging them with the crime of conspiracy. They colluded with other banks to manipulate the overall rate. rate. And these other banks are banks like the Royal Bank of Scotland, the Deutsche Bank, uh, Credit Suisse, and JP Morgan and Citigroup. And of course, we've seen other organizations like HSBC and Bank of America when they were involved in money laundering for drug dealers Nobody went to jail. They got a fine that was a slap on the wrist compared to the amount of money that they had made. So we see this difference in the way people are treated. It's absolutely outrageous. It destroys everything that our legal system is based on, that they could confiscate your property by the legal fiction that your property committed a crime, even though you, while you were operating your plane or had your cash, did not commit a crime. It's absolutely outrageous. And going back to one of those cases there, I mean, I've got the quote of an officer who, this was his justification for confiscating a driver's cash. Quote, common people do not carry this much U.S. currency. <laughs> we saw in the case there, it was $2,400, which yeah. in today's world with the inflation is not a great deal of money, especially if you're going on a long trip. I mean, I've been interrogated before for taking over 2,000 euros through an airport. So... It really is insane how they're treating just the carrying of cash. And I guess... And let's understand, too, that cash is probably not going to make it back to the police department. It's going to go in the pocket of that corrupt cop, most likely. That's the another issue, is that it corrupts law enforcement. It doesn't just destroy our due process. It corrupts law enforcement. And that's what happens when we try to solve a problem that is essentially a, a medical problem, a psychological problem, a spiritual problem. We try to solve it with this hammer called force. You know, that's the, the using the government against it. It failed with alcohol prohibition, but at least they had the decency and the respect for the law to enact a constitutional amendment. They didn't even bother with that for everything that they're doing in the war on drugs. They don't even have the authority, they didn't even give themselves the authority under the Constitution to do it. They're just using raw, intimidating force. And I mean, it becomes endemic to a point where, you know, if, if the cops see other people doing this, they see them stealing the cash, pocketing it in some cases. Just like the TSA, where they would steal your iPad, steal numerous other valuable items, it becomes kind of expected, kind of embraced and accepted by the other employees that this is just mm -hmm. how, this is just the way it's done. So, you know, it, it, it feeds off itself in a way, David. Yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. And I hope that people are finally, as I said, it's good to see the mainstream media picking it up. Comedians joking about it, even though it is kind of a, a black humor. Uh, hopefully, we will do something about it, as we talked about earlier in, uh, or last week when you and I were here in the studio. The incarceration rate that America has is just outrageous compared to every other country. We put a much larger percentage of our population in jail than even uh, repressive communist regimes have done in the past. What's interesting about the fact that it is, you know, in a in a comedy piece is the fact that those comedy shows, particularly Comedy Central. They're only beaten now by Fox News in terms of viewers. All the top uh, evening Fox News shows get the most viewers, obviously. But now the likes of Comedy Central, The Daily Show, are beating CNN, beating MSNBC, because at least they give you a little bit of truth in with all the satire, whereas you're not going to get that with uh, the big networks, obviously. But moving on, David, you wanted to mention this American journalist who caught Ebola. Yeah, we're, we're seeing, and again, this goes back to the, we talked about earlier, the difference between the way it's treated politically and the way that it's treated medically. And of course, the political aspect has uh, 
a political correctness aspect to it. We have this story on Infowars.com. Neighbors of Ebola patients say that they feel discriminated against. Well, the reality is, is that if you look back at the apartment complex where this lady that uh, Mr. Duncan caught it from lived, nine people are dead there. Both of her parents have Ebola. Her brother has already died of Ebola. Uh, Mr. Duncan has it. So basically, that apartment complex has essentially become a... Uh, death sentence for everybody over there. And this is what they said. They said, we've been through this over and over again. We tell people, no matter how much you love the person, it is the health authority's responsibility to, to pick up the sick people. That's the message that we're not getting from the CDC, from Judge Jenkins. They're giving people just the opposite message. They're cavalierly coming into these areas and, and just talking about how there's zero risk. And of course, risk is not a binary thing. It isn't like there's a 100% chance you're